A lot of you are interested in drawing pet portraits or you have a pet that you want to draw for yourself. So I thought I'd show you the process that I use when I'm creating pet portraits using pastels and give you some tips along the way and show you what I'm doing step by step. I'm Kirsty Rebecca and I make drawing and painting tutorials that are easy to follow even if you're just starting out. I'm working on Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper, which is my favourite paper to use for pastels. I like the smooth sandpaper like texture it has and it's not too rough so the end result can look smooth. It also holds pan pastels really well and allows for many layers of pastel. You can get pastel matte in thin card or you can buy it mounted which is really nice because it's a sturdy option that tends to look a little bit more presentable because it's on a solid surface, especially for commissions. I've transferred the outline onto my surface by using transfer paper, but you can freehand it if you like. I'm starting out using pan pastels for the background and for the base layer of the dog. And if you don't know what they are, they're kind of like a soft pastel compressed into a round container like powder foundation or blush. And you apply it using soft tools, S-O-F-F-T, which come in a variety of shapes and sizes. I'll leave a link to a video below that shows you a little bit more about how to use pan pastels if you're interested. But they are great for creating really soft out of focus backgrounds or smooth blends and if you lay them down lightly it's a really quick way of getting your underlayer for your main subject. If you want to create a really soft look with pan pastels like I'm doing in the background just keep adding layers until it looks as soft as you like. The more layers that you add the easier it will be to blend the pan pastel. Just keep in mind that there is a limit to how many layers of pastel you can add before you fill up the tooth of your paper. So if you aren't sure, it's best to try it on a scrap piece of paper first. For most of my pieces, I start with the background because I find it easier to add the fur details on top of the background rather than trying to put the background in between the fur details. You don't have to put a background in, but I always add one when I'm working with pastels because I feel like it can can complete the piece and it can also complement the color of the subject as well. Also pastel can be a bit messy so it's hard to keep the paper around your subject free from pastel so if you do happen to get some pastel onto the background by mistake you can blend it in with your background and you won't notice it. The color I'm choosing for the background is quite bright but I usually pick a more muted earthy color or the client or customer will choose a color that might suit their decor. But if you are unsure what colour to choose, pick a colour that is already in the background of your original photo. The colours in the background are usually reflected in the fur of the animal, so picking a colour that already exists in your photo will more likely create a harmonious piece. It's up to you which colours you use, but a good way to test it out before applying it to your piece is by putting your reference image into Photoshop or an editing program and just try it out first. In this case, the dog was sitting on a stone footpath outside and they were kind of like a blue or grey colour with hints of purple and pink where the sun hit the path. And I chose to use those blues and purples in my background and I'm going to make sure that I include some of these colours in my dog as well so it creates a more cohesive look. When I do my base layers for the dog, I always choose a colour that is slightly darker than what, what it looks on my reference so that I can add lighter details on top. I create the fur texture by layering and you have to have a darker colour down first to be able to put those lighter layers on top, otherwise it won't show up. I try and find the darkest colours in that area of the animal's fur and then use that as a base layer for that area. So you'll need to remember that on different parts of the animal the colour will be different. So the parts that are in shallow, shadow will be a different colour to the parts that are in the sun. So try not to put the same colour everywhere, just pay attention to your reference photo. If you're unsure of what colour to use, you can import your reference photo into Photoshop or another editing program and then use the eyedropper tool to pick out the colours. You can see in the base layer that I've added some of the purple colour from the background. It looks a bit funny now, but it will look nicer in the end. When I use pan pastels, I usually don't fill in the small areas like the eyes and the nose because there's a lot of detail there and it's easier to just go straight in with pastel pencils because the soft tools are... They're not as easy to, to control and the pastel pencil has a smaller tip. I must have lost this little bit of footage but after I've applied all the pan pastel I always blend it into the paper either using my finger or with a tissue wrapped around my finger and that way the 
pastel doesn't just sit on the surface of the paper filling up the tooth it's pushed into the paper so that way you you're able to add more layers of pastel pencil on top of that it also blends the colors a little bit more smoothly together and you can see that I'm resting my hand on a piece of paper that's on top of my artwork and that's just so that I don't smudge my artwork with my hand now I'm going in with pastel pencils for the next few layers. My go-to brands are Stabilo, Carbothello and Faber-Castell Pit Pastels, but I also sometimes use the Derwent Pastel Pencils or Caran d'Ache Pastels as well. You don't need a huge range of pastel pencils to start with. I'd probably recommend getting the Pit Pastels because in Australia they're much easier to get a hold of than other brands, and they also have a few more colours than the Carbothellos, but they're both good, out, good to start out with. I'm overlapping the fur detail onto the background so it doesn't look like I cut and paste the dog onto the background. Your pencils don't need to be really sharp until the final layer where you're putting in more details. In these first few layers I usually blend out the pastel to make it look a bit softer and smoother and to save those smaller details until the end. If you have a sharp point on your pencil all the way through then you'll waste more of your pencil. The tip snaps off and crumbles quite easily because of the nature of pastel pencils. So I try and sharpen it with a Stanley knife or a craft knife just to remove the wooden casing as often as I can. And then I'll sharpen it with a manual crank handle sharpener if I really need a fine point. When I do the eyes, I always pay really close attention to the reference photo because the shapes and colour don't always make sense, especially in the reflections. But if you copy it exactly, it will look right in the end. The eyes are the most important part of a pet portrait for me, so I always spend a bit longer making sure that they're correct. I'm then going in with a blending stump to soften out the graininess and blend some of the colours together a bit more. You can also use a cotton tip if you don't have a blending stump. And then I'll go back through with another layer of colour and repeat the process until I like the way it looks. Here I'm adding in some fur detail. It looks quite messy at the moment and really quite grainy, but I'll blend it out to make it a bit softer so you won't see those pastel strokes that I'm putting down. It would just be a general gist of the fur direction. And I'm just adding in more layers and different colours to the fur so it gives that depth in the fur. That's also really important to make sure that when you're laying down your pencil strokes that they go in the right direction. Make sure that you follow your reference photo closely because the fur can change directions a lot, especially around the eyes and the nose area. I also pay attention to how long my pencil strokes are. If you're creating a long stroke in an area with short fur like on top of the nose, then that fur will look weirdly long and out of place. Moving on to the nose, which seems to be a tricky part for a lot of people. The trick is to copy your reference photo. Even if something seems weird, adding certain colours or shadows where they are on your photo, it will end up coming together if you copy it. Just don't assume that you know what a nose looks like. It will look more realistic if you copy the shapes and the colours on your reference photo. Pastels is really just a layering process. Add a layer, then blend it out, and continue to add layers until you like how it looks. You don't always have to blend it out though. You can use some of that texture of the pastel pencil to your advantage. For example, on the nose, there's quite a lot of texture and lots of little tiny dimples. So if you leave the little white highlights that I've got here at the moment as they are, it can create a really nice texture in the final piece. The way that I work with pastels is that I don't put in every single strand of hair because it takes a really long time and I don't think it's necessary to create a realistic piece. The only time you would actually see every individual hair is if you had your nose pressed to the canvas or if you zoom in on a post on social media or your website. I like to just give the general gist of the fur direction because it makes for a more realistic and interesting piece. It looks realistic, almost like a photo from a normal viewing distance, and then when you stand really close, you can see the pastel strokes or the pencil strokes, which make it look like a more painterly and interesting piece. I find that if I can't see the detail that I'm adding from a few steps back at a normal viewing distance, then there's no point having that detail there, in my opinion. For a painting to look realistic, the two most important things are to make sure that you have an accurate outline to start with and to make sure that your values are correct. It doesn't matter how much detail you add if your values aren't correct. Make sure that your shadows are dark enough and that your highlights are light enough. You can check to see if your artwork is accurate by taking a photo of it and comparing it to your reference photo on your computer or your phone. I always focus on the values rather than meticulously copy the photo exactly down to the last strand of fur. 
And that's just how I like to work because it allows me to spend more time creating more pieces that I can have for sale and it also gives me extra time to make these tutorials for you guys. But of course it's totally up to you how much detail you want to put in. Also it's actually quite difficult to get every strand of fur working this size in pastels. If you do manage to sharpen your pastel pencil to a fine point it will most likely crumble as soon as you start using it or wear down really quickly. If you want to get every detail in you could try working larger with pastel so that the tip of your pencil doesn't have to be as small because of the scale of your drawing. To make my artwork look more interesting, I like to pick out colours that don't seem obvious in the reference. Like I've put subtle hints of purple, magentas, reds and greens throughout this piece because having those hints of colour really makes the drawing pop and it doesn't look as flat. A good tip when you're working with pastels is to tape down your work with masking tape onto your desk or onto a drawing board. And I always make sure that I get acid free, low tack masking tape so that it doesn't destroy any part of my artwork. And once you're finished, you can take that tape off and it will leave a nice clean border all the way around your piece, which is, makes it a lot easier to hold onto and it also is easier to frame. I always make sure that before I cut down my pastel mat to the right size that I'm including that half inch border all the way around my piece. For example, this is a 9 inch by 12 inch, so I would cut my pastel mat paper down to a 10 inch by 13 inch. When it comes to whiskers, it can be quite hard to achieve, especially when you're first starting out and you haven't done it before. The most common mistake is that people put too much pastel down on their previous layers. If there's already a lot of pastel on the paper, it will be very hard to add whiskers on top. The amount of pastel that you can add to your paper comes with practice and it will get easier the more pieces you create. The second problem is that you aren't using the right paper. If you're using a pastel paper that isn't a sanded paper or pastel mat, it's very hard to add more layers, making it almost impossible to get a crisp line for whiskers. The third problem is getting a sharp point on your pastel pencils. And I'll leave a link below about sharpening pastels because I had so many issues with this when I first started out. If you're struggling to get those whiskers on top, try using a softer pastel. Faber-Castell, Pitt Pastels, Carbothello and Derwent are all very similar in hardness. Derwin is probably the softer of the three, but I usually start out with these three brands depending on the colour that I need, and then I'll use the Caran d'Ache pastel pencils if I need a soft pastel to make the colour pop, or to add the whiskers. The softer pastels tend to go on top of the harder pastels quite a bit easier, and, are, and they're a bit more opaque as well. I've got a playlist on the screen that I think you'll find helpful, so click on that and I'll see you over there. <laughs>